Hey, what's up, Sailors and Chief? My name is Sailor Snubs. Welcome to my YouTube channel, all about Sailor Moon news, merch reviews, and how to's. I know it's been like two weeks or so since I posted my part one review of Sailor Moon Eternal, the movie, but today I am doing part two. And I'm kind of happy that I waited a little bit longer so I could give you an overall reaction to the movies now that I have watched them four times. <laughs> That's not weird, right? four times? I feel like that's pretty normal for a fandom. So I've got my coffee. I am ready to give you my part two impressions and let you know what I think of the movies overall. I say movies and then I say movie. I know that it's two parts, so I just go back and forth, deal with it. So in my last review, you know that there was a few different switches that happened at the very end of the part one movie, which kind of made sense given that they were really focusing on the outer Sailor Senshi at the very beginning of the second part of the movie. And even though it wasn't that way in the manga, it made sense to me, so I was totally okay with that change. So at the beginning of part two of Sailor Moon Eternal, we do get reintroduced to the outer Sailor Guardians. And this starts off with a cute little dream sequence from Usagi. She's giving us kind of a voiceover and she basically says, my dream is to live in this beautiful home and have family and countryside and it's so gorgeous. Well, the house that they are showing is the house that the Outer Sailor Guardians are living in. That includes Setsuna, Michiru, Haruka, and Hotaru. So we had previously seen the Outer Guardians at the very end of the very last season of Sailor Moon Crystal. They left with a little baby Hotaru. Turns out they've been gone for about six months, and when we come back, it turns out that Hotaru, even though she's still a child, she's already out of diapers. She's obviously growing at a very fast pace, and they're basically doing a co-parenting thing. Uh, Michiru and Haruka are basically married. Setsuna hangs out at the house as like a co-parent, I guess. It is a very progressive household and I really appreciate that. So we do get this one moment where Setsuna is hanging out at the house, but she's thinking about the eclipse. She ended up seeing the eclipse from her own observatory, a lab where she was working, and when it happened, she got a vision of lemurs. She of course got a bad feeling about it. She wanted to transform she could not transform. So at this point, she's very much debating, as well as Michiru and Haruka, are they ever going to be able to transform again? Or are all of the threats over? Do they have any reason to transform? We also get to see that Michiru is a violinist teacher. So she is teaching violin to some really cute little kids that come over to the house to learn. Hotaru is one of those kids. And when Hotaru plays the violin, you see this really interesting ghostly image of a little Chibiusa and a little Pegasus. So she sees these ghostly images run into the hallway. She chases them down, Hotaru does, and she finds Chibiusa crying, kneeling over what looks like a dead Pegasus. They realize at this point that Hotaru must be waking up as Sailor Saturn. We also see a really cool scene of Haruka looking like a whole snack, and Hotaru is using her powers to create a little image of a solar system. It's our solar system. And when she fast forwards from the Big Bang down to present day, we see the eclipse happen. And when the eclipse happens, the entirety of the moon just goes completely dark. It's super creepy and it gives them all a very, very bad feeling. Later that evening, Hotaru is taking a bath. She's getting ready for bed. And then she wakes up as Sailor Saturn. She sees an image of Sailor Saturn. She realizes that is her and she is awakening. So she does have another grow spurt and then she goes to tell Setsuna, Michiru, and Haruka that it's her turn to help protect them and guide them and she gives each of them their sailor crystals and then they can all transform. She does have a premonition that the prince and princess must be in trouble so they all transform. They end up racing down to where the inner guardians are still fighting their fight with the Amazon S quartet and they end up helping the inner senshi get released from that trap. They transform and they save the day. So that is basically the first scene, and it's actually quite long of a first scene. So you really get a very good in-depth impression of who the Outer Sailor Senshi are. You get really good introductions to them if you've never seen them before, or if this is your first time watching Sailor Moon Crystal and Sailor Moon Eternal, then you get a pretty full understanding of where they're coming from and why they are in this household and who is this Hotaru that they are raising. I thought it was kind of funny that Haruka sees this like discounted store selling diapers and she's like, oh, we should totally buy them. Michiru has to remind Haruka, 
yeah, Hotaru's out of diapers, so we don't really need to buy those, but good on you, Haruka, for always looking for a discount. I appreciate that, my lady. Also, how does this group of three young adults afford this, like, gorgeous country mansion? I contemplated with some of my friends that they must have their helicopter pads in the backyard somewhere where you don't actually see them on screen. I also contemplated that maybe Setsuna knows how to buy Bitcoin because she's on her computer all day. Like she's super smart. And also she looks like a snack with her outfit in the first scene. Can we just talk about that for a second? Cause oh my gosh, Setsuna, you look amazing. Like I wish I had a body that looked like that girl, girl. <laughs> I mean, she controls the door of time. She could go backwards and forwards in time as much as she wanted to. Like if she wanted to break some rules, she totally could. And I feel like, you know, maybe that's Part of the reason why they can afford this mansion is because like maybe one day she just went forward in time and she was just like, hmm, that Bitcoin from 2012, interesting. And then she went back in time and she just invested tons of money in it. And that's what she's doing on the computer all day. Like she is investing money in Dogecoin and Bitcoin and whatever other coins that she can get her hands on. Oh, also amazing, amazing note to add right here. There's some gorgeous animations happening at this point in the movie. First, we get Sailor Saturn's transformation, which should have been longer. It should have been just as long as all of the other outer guardians, in my personal opinion. But I love the fact that they gave her a transformation sequence. It was so cool and it gave me chills. Absolutely loved it. So Sailor Jupiter looks at Sailor Saturn, realizes that she's grown up all of a sudden. So she's just like, oh, you grew up. And Sailor Saturn just looks at her and she's just like, so Chibiusa and Usagi are still back at home. Usagi is sick in bed because she caught the pandemic from Mamoru. <laughs> she caught the curse from Mamoru. So she, now she's in bed, she's coughing as well, just like Mamo is. Sailor Saturn does use her powers, even though she is at like the Dead Moon Circus right now, she uses her powers to reach out to Chibiusa, who is still back at her home. So Chibiusa does realize that the outer Sailor Guardians have come to help the inner Sailor Guardians so she transforms and she goes off to help them as well. Usagi, who is not wearing a mask, by the way, even though she's obviously infectious, uh, she ends up meeting up with Mamo-chan and they basically decide like, hey, we're both sick, but Usagi's like, uh, I'm still gonna help. I have to go defend all of my friends and help them. So she ends up racing off to help the others. At this point in the movie, we get introduced with this Pretty long introduction from Zirconia. Zirconia does end up triggering that infection, that curse that's within Mamo-chan and Usagi when they arrive at the Dead Moon Circus where all of the other Sailor Guardians are. Pegasus, or Helios, ends up realizing that they are getting sicker and sicker. So he uses his powers to turn Usagi and Mamoru into teeny tiny little toddlers and then they disappear from the surface of the earth and go down to Elysium. While this is happening, Chibi Moon and Sailor Saturn end up chasing down the Amazonas Quartet into the Dead Moon Circus and they end up disappearing off somewhere trying to fight them. So even though Sailor Saturn is extremely strong, she basically tells the Amazonas Quartet, hey, I know that you are being manipulated right now. So before I attack you, I'm going to give you a chance to just turn sides and come join us instead and be peaceful. But the Amazonas Quartet is like, no, we ain't having it until at one point she almost, almost has them, almost tells them and gets them to understand that they are being manipulated. But Zirconia shows up and what does she do? She traps them in these little Amazonas Quartet balls, these little spheres and they cannot escape. And then she traps Sailor Saturn and Chibiusa or Chibi Moon in glass shards as well. So they can't escape either. They are all trapped. I would like to point out Sailor Saturn has some really cool attacks and really cool deflective purposes in this scene. She uses Silence Wall to protect herself. And she also uses Silence Glaive Surprise, which I thought was so cool to see in action. I thought it was beautiful and I really like that they were like real-time attacks as opposed to something that goes to an animated sequence. 
So while all of this is happening, we also find out that Usagi and Mamoru, who have been transformed into little teeny tiny baby toddlers and they look so adorable, well they're over in Elysium at the moment with Helios. Usagi is passed out so she does have this cute little dream sequence of her waking up in this adorable little home with the cute little child Mamoru and she's a cute little child Usagi and they have this happy little life together. It's adorable. But she does realize because of some of the conversation with Mamoru in this dream that it is a dream. So she does end up waking up and she realizes that she's in this apocalyptic looking Elysium with Helios. So Helios does turn them back into adults and he has purified the curse from their bodies. He then tells them to be very quiet because Nehelenia could be listening and he leads them over to the main shrine or the main temple that is within Elysium. And turns out within this temple, there are these protective crystals, these really big crystals. So within these crystals are two maenads and these these maenads look like beautiful princesses. They happen to have the same hairstyle as Usagi. They have odangos, which is so cute. They're like priestesses and they also are a part of this shrine. So they're trying to protect this beautiful kingdom, which is like a golden kingdom from any kind of attacks. And unfortunately they weren't able to, so they're now enshrined within these crystals. Helios does tell Mamoru about how his family, the Endymion family, was protecting the golden kingdom, which was this kingdom on earth. He tells him about the golden crystal and how the golden crystal was used to protect earth as well. That crystal is the source of his power and that is why it is so important and why Nehelania wants it. And then Helios also mentions, oh yeah, by the way, I had this gorgeous vision of what turns out to be Princess small lady serenity and she is basically telling him hey there's a really bad thing that's gonna happen and you need to know about it so fyi you really need to find this beautiful maiden this protector because if you don't the world could be destroyed so he mentions like hey we need to find the golden crystal usagi's like oh hey mamoru maybe it's within you because you know you're an endemian so maybe turns out she's bright usagi does notice that within this temple there is a cage and within that cage is pegasus so she's immediately like oh my god, that's Helios, we need to go save him. And she goes chasing after the cage. Helios is like, no girl, don't go over there, it's bad. And then she ends up getting shocked. Nehelania gets notified that something is going on down at Elysium. And then Helios is like, oh, okay, we need to send you guys back to the surface. So he sends Usagi and Mamochan back to the surface where they transform. Helios does end up sending up some of the crystals from Elysium to help protect the surface while Zirconia is basically attacking all of the Sailor Senshi. Sailor Moon and tuxedo mask do end up getting smacked down by zirconia and some of the sailor senshi like sailor venus think that sailor moon is dead because she ends up turning into stone and turning into ash but it turns out this is a dream sequence and this dream sequence was changed a little bit from the manga so in the manga and i feel like this was a change that we didn't necessarily need to make maybe they were trying to do it to keep the pg rating down or something but in the manga you see like skulls like they turn into burning flesh and it looks like their flesh is melting off. And then you see these like disgusting skulls and the skulls and the skeletons start melting. Like it's super creepy. It looks like it's out of a classic horror film. If you can like get that kind of vision from the manga and it's, it's creepy, it's scary. But in the movie, it was a little bit lackluster. Like, oh, they turned into stone and then turned into ash, but there was never any like melting flesh or anything. I know it's weird, but I would have appreciated seeing that because I feel like it would have given it a much more tense feeling situation, which you didn't get that tense feeling from it. So while this is all happening, the cats are in the command center underneath the arcade, of course. And I do have to say it, the Sailor Moon Crystal command center looks way better than it does in the 1990s anime. Like you actually get a good idea of the geometry and how this place is set up, the architecture of the command center. Like it's so cool looking. I would love to go down there and work. I mean, I'd be happy to be hired by the Sailor Guardians and just be in charge of the command center, kind of like a security comms. I think that would be pretty dope. So Diana sees everything that's happening on the screen. She wants to go chase them down and help them. But of course, Luna and Artemis are like, girl, you need to stay here. There's nothing you can do. Just trust in our sailor guardians. Back on the surface, Tuxedo Mask is able to figure out that even though everybody's turning to ash and stone, this is actually a dream. He breaks out of the dream sequence. He gets everybody else out of this dream sequence. They use sailor planet power to 
basically smack down Zirconia or smack her back a little bit, just, you know, knock her out for a second. And then they all run into the main circus tent. So Sailor Moon and the other Sailor Senshi notice that Zirconia was not necessarily knocked out. She is just running into one of the mirrors. She's trying to escape. So Sailor Moon chases after her and she is able to get through one of the mirrors. Even though she's able to get through, all of the other Senshi are not able to get through and they basically get smacked down by these mirrors. At this point, Sailor Moon finally comes face to face with Queen Nehalania and she figures out that Sailor Saturn and Chibi Moon are trapped in glass shards. Eventually she's able to free them um, eventually the other Sailor Guardians are able to free Sailor Moon, Sailor Saturn, and Chibi Moon from the mirror so they all escape. But they realize, okay, even though we escaped and that ship from the Dead Moon Circus and the Dead Moon Circus itself has all disappeared somewhere, they realize that the surface of Earth is still covered in this weird darkness where you can't see stars. They realize that the crystal shards are still there. So what's going on? Oh, turns out the Dead Moon went down to Elysium. So of course, all of the Sailor Senshi follow. So the main ads who are down in Elysium, they welcome the Sailor Senshi, the Guardians, with open arms. They say, welcome, we're so excited that you're here. And then you hear them screech, and it's because the Dead Moon Circus is on the way down to Elysium, and Queen Nehalania finally shows herself in her mirror. She just kind of appears on the surface of Elysium. So Nehalania kind of tells her story at this point. She reveals that she was also in the Moon Kingdom. She was there on the Moon's surface way back in the time of the Silver Millennium. She knew Queen Serenity and she knew Princess Serenity when she was a teeny tiny little tot, a little baby. During this discussion, Sailor Moon does try to attack Queen Nehalania, but her attack ends up getting deflected back onto the Sailor Guardians. And at this point, she also has a vision of when she was a baby on the moon. It turns out Queen Nehalania was hiding in the Moon Kingdom, and she had a mirror that she was able to come through, which was just chilling in the Queen's palace, so it was the Queen's mirror, but she ended up stepping through it as an uninvited guest when baby Princess Serenity was being introduced to the Inner Sailor Guardians, and the Inner Sailor Guardians were basically professing that they would be the protectors of Princess Serenity. There were people arriving with gifts, people had champagne on the moon, which was pretty cool. Sounds like a pretty fun place to be. There were trees on the moon, which was interesting. So Queen Serenity sees Nehalania and tells her basically, you have a very dark soul and we don't want you here. So go ahead and go back to wherever you came from. But Nehalania is just like, Beach, you are not native born either. I am allowed to be here just as much as you are because dark levels out with light. Interesting. Nehalania does end up getting destroyed by Queen Serenity's moonstick, but Nehalania chose to put a curse on the Moon Kingdom. Her curse said that the Moon Kingdom would fall and the princess would never ascend to the throne, and that ended up happening. The Moon Kingdom did fall and the princess did die in an attack, so the curse did come true. Sailor Saturn realizes that even though she destroyed everything and allowed for this rebirth process to happen so that all of these guardians were reincarnated, something happened and the mirror survived and Queen Nehalania, or at least a part of her, was also able to survive from this moon kingdom being destroyed. Nehalania was woken by her senses. She realized that even though the silver crystal had disappeared with the moon kingdom, she sensed the crystal again on Earth. So she set her sights on Earth. So at this point, the movie gets a little bit crazy and there's a lot of flashing between sailor guardians and princesses. So I'll, I'll walk us through it. So Queen Nehalania steals the Ginzui Sho, the silver crystal from Usagi and Usagi ends up having that curse come back. Her and Mamoru then are coughing again because that curse has come back. The, the crystal is no longer able to protect them. But through the strength of power and love, even though Usagi lost her crystal, she was able to get it back and transform. And when she transforms with this power of love, with tuxedo mask, she turns all of the Sailor Guardians into princesses. We also get to see Luna, Artemis, and Diana turn into their human forms. We get to see the human cats. It's so cute! Those cute little fairy senshi appear again, the solar power guardians. They end up appearing again in front of all of the princesses and they give them power ups so that they are able to transform into their eternal sailor senshi figures. 
Sailor Moon's Holy Grail also upgrades to the Eternal Tiara, so we get to see her really cool new staff from Sailor Stars, which is awesome, and she transforms into Eternal Sailor Moon. And with this, of course, we see the upgrade of Sailor Moon's brooch to the Eternal brooch. We also see the upgrade of her attack. So at this point, everybody sends Sailor Moon their crystal power so that Sailor Moon can attack Queen Nehalania with her new attack upgrade. And that includes Tuxedo Mask, which is really cool because you get to see Tuxedo Mask kind of be a part of this crystal power, which is a very awesome way to bring that power of friendship and love into this movie so that you get to see Starlight Honeymoon Therapy Kiss, the attack from Eternal Sailor Moon, and she's able to destroy Nehalania. You then get to see Elysium turn into this beautiful, gorgeous land with tons of greenery and beautiful blue skies and this beautiful blue lake in front of them. You get to see the surface of the earth turn back to normal and people start waking up and coming out of these dream sequences. So at this point, Nehalania is destroyed and Sailor Moon as Eternal Sailor Moon and the Sailor Senshi as Eternals, they're all totally good now. Usagi has another really cute flashback of her with Queen Serenity when she's just this adorable little toddler and it's it's the cutest. I love the flashback sequences. They're the best. Also, we should mention the music during Nehalenia being attacked and destroyed finally. So good. Great music for this entire scene. It was so cool to listen to. I was totally into it. And the entire time I was like, yeah, you get it, Eternal Sailor Moon. You do the thing and you destroy her. <laughs> Oh, I feel like such a dork. Uh, Chibiusa does see Helios and he looks to be either dead or passed out, but she is able to awaken him with a kiss. It's super cute. Helios at this point is able to give this brand new staff to Tuxedo Mask. And this staff also comes with the golden crystal on top, which is really cool to see in action. It's this cool sequence. At this point, Sailor Moon and Tuxedo Mask turn into King Endymion and Queen Serenity. It's so pretty. They use the Eternal Tiare and they use the Golden Crystal, which is on King Endymion's staff, to destroy the mirror and just turn it to dust. And it just floats away into dust and ash. All of the princesses turn back into their guardian selves. There's a lot of that going on during this scene. And eternal Sailor Saturn walks up to Queen Serenity and is like, hey, I have these orbs. There's people in here. It's the Amazon S Quartet. Can you save them? And Queen Serenity is able to. So she releases the spirits of the Amazon S Quartet. The Amazon S Quartet turn into the guardians of the asteroids, hence their names. I mean, we knew that this was going to happen from the manga, of course, but seeing it in action, animated, was so cool. This was another one of those moments that gave me chills where I was just like, oh, I was waiting for it. And then it happened and I was just like, yes! Asteroid Guardian, so cool. So these are Chibi Moon's future guardians. They tell her that when you become a fully fledged guardian, we will be there to protect you. And then they basically just leave and say, hey, we'll be back when you're older, but for now we're just gonna sleep for a long time. Helios, who now has a Pegasus for his own, which we don't know where that Pegasus came from or whether that was another being or maybe Helios just, I don't know, created this Pegasus. We don't really get that answer, but we know that it is his steed and he takes the rest of the Sailor Senshi, everybody else, up to the surface of Earth and leaves them there. He also tells Chibi Moon, hey, we'll meet again. It's all good, girl. And then he leaves. So now that everything is lovely again around Earth, we see the ending of the movie. And it's basically Usagi foreshadowing the next arc for the manga. She tells Mamoru everybody has a star inside of them. Everybody has a star inside of their heart. That's also the same thing that Queen Serenity told her when she was just a teeny tiny little toddler on the moon. And this is also foreshadowing for star seeds end and movie. This is the end of the movie and then we roll the credits and they are the most boring credits that I have ever seen for an anime which was very interesting. The music was really cool but it was just white text on a black background. Couldn't they have given us more than that? I feel like they could have. Okay so I wanted to end this first with some thoughts from my Instagram fam. So if you aren't following me I'm at Sailor Snubs over there. So I did ask over on Instagram what your opinions of Sailor Moon Eternal were so I wanted to go ahead and share some of the those opinions with you. Ramon.nr says, I think they were lovely. I enjoyed both parts, but part two was, in my opinion, the best. An anonymous reply was, I am so in love with the silver millennium scenes. 
Yeah, I can relate to that. Another anonymous reply, the movies were so disappointing, everything feels so rushed, and the addition was so bad, plus the scene changes are horrible, there is no respite between events, the animation is worse than the previous seasons, except for less than five scenes, the character movements are so frameless, and the transformations, OMG, literally everything is traced from season three and supers. Problems arrive and are very quickly solved, every inner spotlight moment, there are scenes that last too much and do not lead to anything and others that deserve more time. And the lack of a soundtrack is insulting. Lots of scenes happen silently and it's awkward. The only good things, Amy's henshin, Mars attack, world shaking, and the final battle. Everything else sucks. Anonymous says, the film was mind blowing. That's all they said. That was their reply. <laughs> Another anonymous reply, I love the movies. I especially really love getting to see Luna, Artemis, and Diana in their human forms. This reply says, animation transformations, attacks gave me chills. Pacing could have been better though. Another follower said, I love the Crystal series. It's so beautiful and it makes me so happy it follows the manga. Another one said, it was rushed and it jumped from one scene to another. Should have been a series in my opinion. I liked it. I wish they would have shown the depth of Chibiusa and Helios's relationship though. I loved them the whole time. I could not get over how pretty the art is. I love this arc so much though. Also, Princess Pluto in that dress is low-key the best part. Sab underscore DE said, I thought the movies were stunning and was teary-eyed the whole time. Aww. And Odango said, loved it. As somebody who hasn't read the manga, I enjoyed this new version. Oh, that's interesting. I've read the mangas myself, so for me, I also really enjoyed them, but I was curious if people who haven't read the manga would still enjoy this movie, even though it might be kind of lost in context. And the last reply says, they were amazing. They were just as I expected them from my favorite arc. Oh, thank you so much for all of those replies on my Instagram. Of course, if you want to follow me, my Instagram is at Sailor Snubs. And I do ask questions from time to time that I would love to throw into future videos. And I also wanted to share some of my reflections. So now that I have watched these movies several times, I do have a little bit more insight to share as far as the movies go. I did see a lot of criticism criticisms of the movie and I feel like those criticisms are totally valid. I love that Sailor Moon brings out so much passion in so many different people and that's just the thing. All of us are very different and all of us have very valid opinions about what we were expecting from these movies. I mean they did have a very long time to create these movies. They had years. We haven't had a Sailor Moon Crystal in years. It's been like half a decade. So they had plenty of time to make these movies everything that we were expecting. So I feel that a lot of the negative opinions are very much valid, given the fact that Toei had such a long time to create something that was everything that we were expecting. And I don't think it was. I do think now that I've watched these movies several times that it should have been a TV series. It definitely should have. Breaking the entire dream arc sequence into multiple episodes so you see more of that character growth like we had in the 1990s anime would have been spectacular if they had the same kind of animations also included in there. They did hire original animators for this movie and I really appreciated that and I could see it. You can see a lot of that growth from how these animators did designs back in the 1990s to how much better they're doing them now. And that's just from the perception of being a human and knowing when you go into a career path, like I'm a YouTuber, you get better over time. 10 years ago, when I started with YouTube, I was really bad. These animators were not bad in the 1990s. And now that they've had such a long time, like 30 years, 25, 30 years, to create new sequences and create these same characters again with new art designs, you can see that change in their expertise. And I really appreciate that. It's probably not a surprise given how excited I was to do these review videos that I truly love them. I absolutely love them and I feel like it's totally fair to critique different things that we see in these movies. For example, I think it would have been really cool if we got new animation sequences for the attacks. The only one that really stuck out to me was seeing Sailor Saturn's transformation finally, that was incredible, and seeing World Shaking, which obviously got some upgrades. Somebody was definitely paying attention to Sailor Uranus Haruka in this movie, part two, because she got 
really, really good airtime. She got some excellent moments in this movie. But the other sequences for transformations and for attacks were basically the exact same animations that we saw in the 1990s. They didn't give us anything fresh except for newly designed characters. So the backgrounds and the sparkly effects and things like that, they look different, of course, but the motions of these different sequences, th those didn't really change. Part two definitely had better pacing than part one. You could really feel it too, because there are a lot of times in part one where you're watching each of the different arcs for each of the different inner sailor senshi, and the whole time you're thinking, whoa, that flew by really fast. But the second part of the movie felt very well constructed. It felt like the timing was well paced, it felt natural, and it didn't lag. There were no moments in the second movie that I felt like were were lagging or didn't need to be as long as they were. I think that if they gave the inner Sailor Senshi as much time as they gave the outer Senshi introductions in the second movie, if they gave the inners that same kind of power in the first movies, uh, it might have come off a little bit different for a lot of fans. But overall, I am happy that we got Sailor Moon Eternal Part 1 and 2. They were really good movies. It was really fun to see so many sequences that we've never seen animated. That was probably my favorite part, and that was really exciting. Will I watch them again? Absolutely. Uh, I do switch back and forth between dub and sub just to give a really good comparison. And I talked a lot about the voice actors in the first part of this review in part one. So definitely check out that video if you haven't already. I also went into a lot of discussion about the music and the backgrounds for different parts, the aesthetic of this movie. My channel did just hit 6,000 followers, which is absolutely insane to me. So I will be doing another giveaway soon. So definitely keep an eye on the channel for that. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the community that we have here. I feel like everybody is super respectful of each other's opinions and I love that. That's not something that you always get when you're doing YouTube videos, so I really appreciate that the community here is very tight-knit and very, very close. I will be back really soon with another video, so definitely stick around, and until next time, I'm Sailor Snubs. Janet.